Yamamoto Nutrition, proud sponsor of RX Muscle. Visit YamamotoNutrition.com. Welcome back to Live With, brought to you by Yamamoto Nutrition. I'm Dave Palumbo, and today's special guests are very well known in our industry. We haven't heard from him in a long time. He's known as the mind, Milos Sharshev, along with our good friend Subi. Now, hey, Dave. hey nice Milos. To good to see you. You're still looking great. Do you see me, actually? Yeah, I see you. You're actually looking uh, very young these days. How old are you now? I'm back in training, you know, full on. You are. Twice a day. Your face, you have the perfect skin. How come you don't, you don't age? Oh, please, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you, look, you look like a very young man. Now, uh, Subi, let me just ask you a question because you are like the guy in the UK who brings in all the stars. You brought Chris Aceto, Sean Roden, you bring Jay Cutler. How do you bring, get all these guys to come to the UK? And, and what do you do with them when you get them there? <laughs> That's a better question. Well, so basically, um, uh, I've been doing like this promotion work with a lot of the athletes. I've been doing it for the last six years in the UK. Um, so I've, I have a lot of good connections with the athletes, etc. Um, so what we do is we set up a tour, um, whether it's a camp, um, whether it's a seminar. So I kind of like facilitate that through my contacts and basically just get the uh, athletes to see the, the athletes, uh, sorry, the uh, fans closer. So I give it a lot more personal interaction with them. Well, the athlete, you must be paying the athletes well because it seems like the athletes love going to your events. Uh, I know you got Milos there for an event this weekend in uh, St. Albans with Charles Claremont. Uh, I haven't heard that name in a long time. Milos, how did, how did that uh, seminar come about? Charles Claremont and you? Yes, actually, Charles is uh, probably my second best, most favorite bodybuilder of all time. Flex Wheeler being the number one and Charles uh, definitely second. Uh, I had a pleasure competing in the 90s with both of them, right? And uh, um, Jim Wonder from uh, Body Limit in St. Albans asked me if I would be interested to do the seminar with Charles and just to see him. I would fly here just to see him and chat with him. But uh, this is how it came about. It's tomorrow at 7 o'clock. Um, Charles disappeared from uh, in the bodybuilding scene. Yeah, I don't know why and exactly what happened, so I'll find out tomorrow, definitely. But... Uh, Again, I would really like to give him a credit. Uh, uh, a lot of people, especially in the United States, they, they probably don't realize how great he was. I mean, he's one of the few that uh, managed to beat the Flex Wheeler on IBB stage. And uh, coming from Baba, you know, having all this uh, possible politics and earning the victory over Flex, it, it's huge. Includes, I mean, it, it wasn't just Flex, it was Kevin, Flex, uh, Sonny Schmidt, and lineup was deep. I mean, uh, he really earned it. That was back in the days, Milos, when you were competing every weekend, right? Around the year, year round. Uh, I, I wish uh, there was more shows. Like nowadays, I would probably have a more shows than Dexter. But back in the day, uh, there was like maybe eight shows a year. I mean, you start with the Ironman Arnold Iron Classic, then you go to Niagara Falls, Chicago, Pittsburgh, the Night of the Champions, and then you wait for Olympia and European Tour. So, you know, pretty much I was quite limited, but um, I, I, for a while, had a record of 72 shows. And uh, Dexter was uh, happy to call me from Australia and tell me that he too fast. <laughs> Dexter's been competing about 10 years longer than you, too. Uh, I didn't hear you. Dexter's been training, uh, been competing 10 years longer than you. It took him to yeah, do Yeah, I mean, the uh, guy is just amazing. I mean, really, you know, let's give a credit where credit is due. Uh, you know, I, I don't see Dexter slowing down, you know, for the next five, six, ten years. Uh, well, back in 91, my first year as a pro, I'll tell you something. Uh, we were going to a European tour, and there was a moment when Van de Media asked me to pick up the passports of all the guys. <laughs> and uh, Albert Beckes was one of them. And uh, I just had to look in the passport to see his age. Right. And I seen it 1930. So oh. he was... 61 year old at, at uh, uh, 1991. Wow. And I was like, Albert, for 61, and he shut up, Milos. You know, because he didn't want anybody to know, really, uh, because, you know, if uh, somebody uh, realizes that he's 61, they're going to start placing him down. But uh, uh, as you know, 
uh, he is the oldest uh, IBB Pro Champion winning Niagara Falls uh, 1991 at the age of 61. That, Unbelievable. That, yeah, a lot of people didn't think he was that old, but you saw his passport, huh? Yes, I've seen the passport, yes. Wow. Crazy. You don't see that anymore, but you know what? Maybe Dexter will be that guy who will continue to compete until he's you know, 80, you know, because uh, he just doesn't seem to get uh, slowed down at all. What, let me ask you a question, Mills, before we get into talking about some, some good stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think about the flex wheel or comeback? You mentioned before that flex was your favorite bodybuilder. Uh, do you think it's a good decision, and how do you think he'll do in that classic physique division? Well, I, I think it is. Uh, I'm a fan. I mean, who is not a fan of flex wheel or physique? Come on. Guy is flawless, you know, he's the most symmetrical guy. And back in the day when uh, he was playing the size game to catch up with Ronnie, Dorian and others, he had to put uh, all that weight. But if he can make weight to be a, a you know, classic bodybuilder, uh, I mean, he has uh, every chance in the world to win it, regardless of his age and regardless of his, uh, you know, surgery and, uh, and uh, kidney transplant. Of course, many people are going to judge him for it. But uh, I always say, once a bodybuilder, always a bodybuilder. Once a competitor at that highest level, you always have an urge. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I, I know that you're a big fan of uh, uh, Kevin in going into last year's Olympia. Uh, I was too, but uh, going into the show for months, you, you could assume he's never showing the legs. Right. And, you know, that, that was quite apparent. If this year he comes with the wheels, I mean, Kevin can easily win some show. It'll be interesting to see what happens um, with both of those guys. Uh, did you ever? Do you, I just had Juan Marquez. I interviewed him. He's making a comeback at 55 years of age. Have you ever thought that to come back yourself, or are you done? No, I, I really don't have it in me anymore. You know, like uh, um, it, it's a curse. You know, when I was competing and, and I was doing like every show, uh, including from 1991 to 99, I was going to just keep going because I enjoyed it. I loved it. There was a challenge. I trained uh, in average like 550 times a year, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, twice a day, every day, you know, Saturday was uh, one and Sunday was off. So, you know, this was a lifestyle. This, this was uh, something I enjoyed doing. And then there was guys including, I mean, I, I love Lee Haney by all means, you know, but he was saying, you know, you have to slow down, you know, you can put so much stress on the body. So, you know, Frank Zane, a few other guys, and uh, my ex-wife at the time, you see, you see, you have to take, uh, you know, some time off. So I forced myself to take a two months off after 99 uh, European Grand Prix Tour. And uh, after two months, it became fourth, became six months. I lost the job. I could not come back into the gym. It, it just, uh, you know, something happened. Yeah, no, yeah life, I always say life happens sometimes. And, you know, life gets in the way. And... Uh... It's very, it's a very selfish lifestyle, the bodybuilding lifestyle. You know that you have to stay like mentally focused. You can't deviate. And when, like you said, when you start, when you come back to reality, sometimes you realize what the hell was I doing? I can't go back to this, this, this craziness. And it's a very yes. intense type of thing. Do you think guys are lazy this, these days? They don't want to do a lot of shows, and they're and they're losing out opportunities because of that. Well, I really don't understand how can anybody pass an opportunity to make money you know, make a, a statement. Uh, it, it's like, today I don't want to go to the job. I mean, this is why I competed in pretty much every show that was organized. Uh, I remember back in the day when uh, Chris Cormier realized, or, or Dexter, Dexter was saying, oh, I'm going to do, you know, Milos. He doesn't call me Milos, he calls me Milos. <laughs> doing, doing all the shows. No, really, I mean, come on. Keeping yourself in shape and entering shows should be your job. Uh, sponsors, uh, you know, endorsers should you know, pretty much force them to do it. I mean, uh, uh, you don't want to be in a shape uh, uh, for one show. You want to be in a shape year round. And if you are, why don't you compete all over the world, you know, make a connections and opportunities for yourself. And money, of course. Of course. Now, Milos, you and I were in uh, uh, Dubai together in 1996. Uh, it was basically just a desert with a lot of buildings just being started to be built. And I don't think you and I could ever have imagined what Dubai and Qatar and, and, and Kuwait would become 15, 20 years later. Looking at the bodybuilding scene over there now, are you, are you shocked or are you pretty much, were you expecting to see the tremendous talent that's coming out of the Middle East now? In 96, when we were there, of course, I didn't expect it. But, uh, you know, soon after, I know that uh, Dennis James was going to Kuwait uh, with uh, Badr Budai and uh, you know spreading the knowledge 
And uh, a lot of Ara Arabic guys, if you can see right now, they're taking over. They have a incredible genetics, work ethics, and, and uh, you know, they're not on top of the world. But back then, I didn't expect it. Uh, I'm sure you remember that uh, uh, I was doing a guest posing at the, at the Arab uh, Games. Yep. And, um, uh, yeah, the, the lineup was, uh, you know, quite below standard. And nowadays you go to Dubai and, and see amateur show and there are guys that looking just just like a professional. Big Rami, uh, do you do you like his physique? Do you think he he will be Mr. Olympia one day? Big Rami. Uh, big Rami. I mean, Big Rami. I, I'm a huge fan and I think that he could easily win Olympia. Mm -hmm. I always said that. I mean, uh, uh, I understand. Last year you were like uh, you know, kind of pissed off at me because I. I <laughs> posted one of his pictures, and uh, I guess he wasn't that good of the picture, so you thought that I was, you know, being harsh on him, no, uh, especially knowing that Chris Isida was uh, preparing him, and I'm a huge uh, uh, fan of Chris's uh, work, and I, I'm friends with Chris for, for many years. No, you know, you misconstrued that. I, I didn't uh, post this picture to put him down. Uh, I'm always uh, saying that uh, even uh, two years ago that he could be a dark horse in the show. Yeah. Uh, you see some... Uh, Comparison pictures, all mandatory poses, you know, from him and uh, and Phil Heath, and uh, really he's giving him run for the money. Yeah, I agree. Now, Milos, as a as a guy who's prepped many many top athletes over the years, um, like yourself, when you see a guy like Big Rami, do you just say to yourself, "Man, I'd I'd love to get a hold of this guy. What what I could do with him?" Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, well, I wasn't really you know fortunate to get like a, you know top guys right away. I was, uh, you know, working with the prospects that I made the top contenders. I mean, you understand back in like 2002, uh, Gustavo Badel was like 24th out of 25 competitors at Olympia, right? 2003, he didn't, uh, you know, uh, place in any of the shows. I competed that year too. And I remember there was uh, Nationals in Miami and uh, Sean Ray, Jay Cutler, uh, Dexter, myself, we had a seminar there. And this is the day when uh, um, uh, Gustavo came to start working with me. And I even remember uh, Sean was looking at me like, oh, like, what are you going to do with him? Like, so, no, seriously. You know, <laughs> Sean, right. Yeah. So I so said, just watch. And as you know, like 2004, he started with third at the Ironman and went into uh, like second GNC and third at Olympia. It's, it was like amazing transformation. Then of course, uh, you know, Dennis Wolf, I mean, Dennis, everybody saw the potential, but uh, you know, 2006, uh, uh, he wasn't doing anything great and finishing at uh, 16th place at Mr. Olympia. So 2007, you know, as I started working with him, you know, first time it was in New York, I remember. Um, Branch won, Dennis James was second, and uh, Dennis Wolf was third. I, I do remember carving him up uh, crazy. It was actually 4,000 grams of carbs, I remember very well. Holy and he, shit. In three days, and, and he actually was flat. Oh so we corrected it two weeks later for a Keystone, which he won. But going into the Olympia, if you remember going into 2007, Nobody really predicted that Dennis could make a, a you know, top five. And, uh, you know, for that show, I, I just decided to create a crazy illusion of a, of a size through that uh, special carb uh, loading. And it worked. And, uh, I mean, uh, he was dwarfing Ronnie at the time. <laughs> and that's... <laughs> if you remember the pictures, I mean, uh, really, uh, we all love Ronnie. Yeah. And we all know what Ronnie represents on the stage, but... Uh, uh, most muscular poses, uh, I mean, he was making him look small. Yeah. So. Well, well Milos, you always had this, this special carb up. You know, you and I, I discussed insulin usage in bodybuilders back in 96, I remember, when we were in Dubai together. I think that's when really people were starting to just experiment. Probably you and I were the first ones to really experiment with it. And you took it to another level. You were a big believer in insulin for building muscle, for carving up and stuff like that. Was that part of the secret Dennis Wolf carb up? Of course, <laughs> come on, <laughs> you, you know that already. I mean, uh, uh, Dave, uh, uh, needless to say, I, I greatly respect you and appreciate what you do. And I know that we don't see eye to eye in many things, especially like insulin. I've seen a couple of your, your shows uh, when you talk quite negatively of insulin. And uh, by all means, uh, um, I, who was the Colette? 
Colette was uh, yeah, um, Colette. You know, she's she's uh, quite an expert, you can see. But uh, if you want to do a special edition on that, I would be more than happy because I, I don't yeah. agree on the, you know <laughs> some things that you guys are saying. I still think that insulin is you know fantastic tool that you can make a, a average bodybuilder look spectacular in a short period what, of time. What just did, we'll do a whole insulin show, you and I, because people will love it. I, I know they're going to be demanding it now that you even mentioned it, but. What, what's the Milo Sarshev like insulin protocol like? You know, the, the, what would be like a typical bodybuilder you would take and put him on in the off season? Off season? Yeah. Well, well you, know, you know, back when I started using like 92, 93, you know, there was only um, long acting insulins available. You know, it's uh, Humulin L, N, R, U, and stuff like that. It wasn't a fast acting like Humalog, Novalog, right. Apidra, or whatever. <laughs> So, you know, we, we were, you know, pretty much um, basic on this. Uh, you see the pharmacokinetic data, when is the onset, when is the peak duration, you know, how long it stays. So I was uh, applying it like this. And as you know, many pros that I work with, like starting with Nasser and Dennis James and, you know, a few other guys, they blew up like uh, 40 pounds in a, in a month. Right. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is actual weight, uh, you know. Uh, you know, when you, when you say 40 pounds in a month, everybody's going to say, you know, shut up, you fucking liar. <laughs> but, but, you know, this is exactly what was happening. And, you know, so you tell me, yeah, if it's only glycogen uh, rehydration, cellular hydration, you know, water, or there is a, a lot of muscle. You could see Nasser 94 being a quite average at the Olympia stage. In 95, a Houston another champion six months later, you look like he, he fell off a different planet. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I'm not against insulin. I'm, I, I actually am an advocate of insulin, but used in the right capacity, I think that the insulin has to be done. Um, so I'm not against insulin by any means. You know, your, your protocols might be a little different than mine, but, but I, I am an advocate of it, and especially when people are using high amounts of growth hormone. What, what, so what, would, what, would Na, what did you give Nasser? Tell us, what, what did Nasser take insulin-wise that you made him such a great, great difference from 94 to 95? 20 units before, 20 units after each training. So if he trains twice a day, that was 80. Okay. And what <laughs> yeah. kind of food would you give him with that, with those insulin dosages? I'm sorry? What, what kind of f food would he eat with those uh, insulin dosages? What would be a meal, his meals? A lot of food. Okay, well, as you know, you know, according to which insulin you use, when it's going to uh, you know, be onset, when it's going to start working, you have to you know, put a certain amount of uh, glucose in. Back in 93, when I was experimenting with, you know, I, I talked to some uh, sports medicine doctors, pharmacologists, nobody could tell me really what is the amount of glucose needed to offset this uh, insulin that you're gonna take. So I started with myself, you know, starting with a two, unit, two grams per unit, went into hypoglycemia, three, four, five, and I was going into hypoglycemic shock every time until <laughs> I reached, yeah, it was there about six, seven units, but I, I was going to 10 grams, you know, per unit. You know, so uh, as you know, I also pioneered this uh, pre, during, post uh, uh, workout supplementation. And uh, I was in a big believer into this. If you saturate the blood with everything in a potentially beneficial, you know, anabolically, you know, uh, to uh, anti-catabolically, uh, you know, to, fat, uh, to burn fat or whatever, and you're going to uh, move that blood into exact muscle that you're going to be training, and you're going to have a most uh, uh, a potent transporter, insulin, you can create a miracle. So I, you know, I was putting most important essential amino acids, creatine, glutamine, betalanine, you name it, citrulline, uh, alcarnitine, anything that made sense to me, you know, I was putting in this. Um, you know, there was uh, many times the guys would come and they would really uh, you know, have to spend like 15, 20 minutes to mix everything, you know, before we start because there was no you know, drinks available, right. you know, this is how I started with the Colosseum uh, supplements and, uh, you know, first during post uh, uh, formula. So, yeah, it, it was, I understand that a lot of people don't agree that you need so much glucose during a training, you know, so, uh, you know, if you use that much insulin, you absolutely have to have it to offset, you know, that uh, exogenous insulin is going to drive your blood sugar level low. Right. So if you 
Could you, I know you have it, you should use one, and you're going to go in hypo guarantee. Right. So all your, all your pre intra post are all predicated on the fact that you're taking so much insulin that you really need to feed the insulin, essentially. Yeah. And yes. I, I want to give you credit. You, you glanced over, but I want to give you credit because you are the person who invented the intra workout nutrition shake. I don't care what anyone says, any companies say, you invented it. You, it, I never even heard the term before you said it. And uh, while some people might not agree with it, I, I'm not a big believer in intra-workout. I kind of believe more in the pre and the post. You created intra, you also created pre-workout. I, you know, I don't think that anyone understood that you were experimenting with these amino acids you know, to increase nitric oxide way before anyone else ever put them out into a nutrition product. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, it, it's great to get a, a confirmation from someone like you. Yeah, I, I didn't see anybody do it before me. Yeah, I consider myself a pioneer, but uh, a lot of other people like to take a credit. So, you know, I'm not too vocal and uh, too much involved in the industry anymore. So, uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, people send me the articles that uh, this guy claimed he invented and so on. <laughs> now, I, as you know, and you've been in the industry for a long time, you know, truthfully, I did it. I, I know you did it. I remember. I remember you talking about it. No one had those products. You had an intra workout, a, a post workout, and a pre workout uh, uh, nutrition supplement. I know you had it. I think you had it on the Coliseum Gym brand or something like that, right? Yes, yes. It was preload, export, and reload. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember when you put it out, and, and, and it was so ahead of people that people didn't even know what, what it was, really. They were like, do you really need this? And, and you were the one who really pioneered that. So I got to you know, take my hat off to you in, in that respect. Um, you really uh, innovated something in our industry, and, and it's pretty hard to do that because our industry seems like it's saturated, like we know everything already, but we really don't know everything. And, and it takes people who have innovative minds to open up new ideas and allow people to explore stuff that never was explored before. So probably a lot of people out there who've made a lot of money off uh, pre-intra workout shakes uh, should, should, should thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or maybe send you a check. Send you a check, yeah. yeah. Send you a royalty check. Yeah, this was never happening, you know, nor will happen. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, uh, I tell you, I mean, uh, I step on a, you know, few feet of, of some people in the industry. Also, you probably don't know that, but uh, you know, there was a time I, I, I was, uh, um, you know, making some big deal. You know, I, I thought I was, and I was, you know, quite vocal about talking that the really protein industry, you know, would shut me you know, off completely if I say what I had to say, but really, let's speak about this. What do you think would be the single most important you know, nutritional supplement for bodybuilders? Uh, one, if you, if you have to choose one, what would be the, the one? I, I would choose a multivitamin, multimineral product. Okay, uh, the multivitamin, but this is uh, uh, mi micronutrients, right? Right, right. You know, we're talking about macronutrients. In Protein, the powder. Protein powder. Protein powder. Okay, so I, I was expecting that. How can protein powder be uh, uh, more beneficial than essential amino acids? Because you know, they, so they contain them already, Milos. They, they, there's there's 11,000 milligrams of branch chain amino acids in one scoop away isolate. Yeah, yeah, hold on a second. You know, uh, let, let, let's, let's have this debate, okay? You, okay? you didn't expect that, you know, so I apologize. But no, I had this discussion you know, many times. Why do we eat chicken, turkey, fish, beef, eggs, whatever, you know, to get uh, not protein, but to, to get essential amino acids, right. you know, from high quality, complete protein from animal source, because those essential amino acids are the ones that the body cannot produce. Thus, most important, non-essential amino acids can very easily be converted, as you know, into, into the glucose and, uh, you know, are not necessary. And when you have in abundance, you know, it can actually be, uh, uh, you know, uh, counterproductive. So we take all this whey protein or other protein that you just mentioned to get those essential amino acids, really. So if you ask me any time, what should I take, protein powder or essential amino acids, there would be a, a no-brainer for me. And, uh, you know, I would take essential amino acids, exact ones that we need, because body can uh, manufacture all the non-essential and bring it into equation when you, you know, have a protein synthesis you know, so you're going to get it. But really, we take protein powders, not for amount of protein there, uh, total amount of amino acids, but for actual essential amino acids. So therefore, you know, I do believe into uh, uh, what I'm saying, that essential amino acids should be number one selling uh, supplement in industry. But when I did talk to a few bigger 
told his distributors they they basically decide not to work with my company because of it. You know, I would kill the protein industry. Well, you know, I, I think you're right and you're, and you're wrong at the same time. First of all, Dr. Scott Connolly told me that recently they've shown that a lot of these what we call essential amino acids are actually not so essential. The body can actually manufacture more of them than we think. Um, the reason why animal sources of protein are so potent is because of their high branch chain amino acid residues. Uh, and we know that that's a, a switch to turn on protein synthesis. Whereas the vegan sources of protein don't have that. And that's why people don't have, have trouble building muscle on those products. Uh, so you are right in the sense that certain of these amino acids are necessary as a stimulus to tell the body, hey, start engaging in protein synthesis. My issue is that by taking only essential aminos, I think you're throwing off the ratios in your body of all the amino acids. There's a reason why chicken protein has a certain ratio of all these amino acids, even though yes. some of them might be what we, what we deem as humans non-essential, I think they are essential. So I think the ratios of the proteins we're consuming are very important and help with the building of a new muscle tissue. Now, post-workout, we know it's the leucine and specifically the branch chains that actually turn on the protein machinery. But after that's done, you got to feed in, you know, complete sources of protein so that the body can repair itself. That, that's my belief, you know, and that, that, that seems to you know, hold up to the research that I've read at least. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, uh, we all eat uh, frequent protein meals anyway. So, you know, with the different absorption rate, you know, if you have a chicken, turkey, fish, eggs through, throughout the day, you're going to have a floating amino acids into your bloodstream anyway. But, uh, you know, uh, limited, the limiting factor for protein synthesis uh, is, is sufficient amount of essential, all the essential amino acids, mm -hmm. not just leucine or, or branch chains, leucine valine, you know, because of mTOR pathway and whatever, you know, you do need to synthesize uh, uh, muscle tissue, you need all eight essential aminos. Yeah, I, you and, know, I agree with you. And, and I'm actually coming out with a new product in my own supplement line called uh, Amino Evolved. It's, that's an essential amino acid product. So I'm not, I think what you're saying is, is, is correct in a sense. I think it's good to, to, to pound a little bit of the extra essential aminos as a supplement to the foods yeah. you're eating and, and the shakes you're drinking. Absolutely, I would add it to, to, you know, in between meals, I would add it to the meals. Mm -hmm. You know, I would add it to everything. Essential amino acids are absolutely number one supplement, in my opinion, that everybody should take. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that uh, people start relying a little too heavily sometimes on supplementation and they're not eating enough food? I, I know, look, I hung out with you. I know you, you got your food planned always. You got your chicken breast, you had your potatoes, your rice. You, you never were without your food. So I have to believe that you know that food is, is, is a huge importance to the bodybuilder. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, if you, sh you could eat all the uh, sufficient amount of protein through the solid food, by all means, you know, but uh, as you know, a lot of people cannot have, you know, as much, you know, chicken and turkey and fish, you know, throughout the day that they got sick of it. So, yeah. you know, they, they figure it's much easier to take through protein powder or essential aminos. But yeah, uh, supplement is exactly as the word says, supplemental thing to your, you know, solid food. Yeah. Now, Mills, what do you think about these guys that, that, that uh, it's called, uh, if it fits your macros, they think, well, as long you could eat like pop tarts and you could eat bacon and you can eat whatever you want, as long as it fits into your protein, fat, carb, macro, nutrient ratios. Um, if, it, if it fits your bullshit, I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, uh, you know, protein is protein, carbs is carbs. I think it's a very important timing of all the nutrients and what you're trying to accomplish. But, uh, you know, yeah, people can be a little bit easier on themselves and, and mix some carbs and fats and whatever. But uh, uh, I would always be specific. You know, my diet is not 24-hour diet. It's like three-hour diet, what you, you know, need until the next meal. Right. You know, so, yeah, if, if your macros at that time is you, you want to be on a ketogenic diet, right? because you're doing nothing. You need a high protein and good source of fat, right. you know, yeah. Uh, if it fits your macros, high protein and good fat, you know, pick whatever good fat you want and whatever good protein, yes. If it fits, you know, that's it. But it had to fit just right, you know? Yeah, well, you, you, know, should, it's you think Pop-Tarts qualify as carbohydrate sources? Pop-Tarts? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, let me be fair and say that yes, you know, post-workout, when you do need the glucose, yeah. you can possibly get away with it. Yes, <laughs> I, I had a, most of my guys, no, seriously, most of my guys, you know, I allow them to take any kind of sweets they like. So uh, some guys are taking, uh, 
Belgian waffles made with uh, oats and uh, you know shitload of uh, honey, apple sauce or whatever. Yeah. You know, some of making uh, uh, cookies at a time. You know, because at that time you need like let's say 100, 150 grams of glucose. Yeah. So mine is that enjoyed it. Right. Well, that's off season too. You're not talking about pre-contest, are you? No, you know, actually, it's quite there. You see, people even now ask me, my guys, even in a contest prep, you know, when I would take their, their you know, carbs away when they don't eat it, they would be pretty much a ketogenic diet until they train. Right. And, you know, sometimes, depends if guys in shape or not, I would have them train without glucose and anything, but then post workout, I would, uh, you know, uh, Gave him a shitload of uh, <laughs> carbs <laughs> with insulin, and at that time uh, I would allow it. I mean, uh, it was interesting. You, you and I talked once at Fibo about Flex Wheeler, right? Yeah. Uh, when he was making that uh, comeback in 2003. You know. So anyway, uh, you know, we had like three weeks to do the miracle. Actually, five weeks to do the Arnold Classic, but uh, because he uh, got in shape so quickly, in three weeks he entered Ironman which ended up being his uh, last contest. But I do remember, you know, like when I was uh, giving him instructions, uh, you know, post-workout in a crazy diet, right? But post-workout, I would give him insulin and uh, let him do the carbs. And among other things, you know, I told him, okay, you can have a honey, apple sauce, apple pie filling, right? Yeah. So he wasn't eating apple pie filling. <laughs> he was eating apple pies. <laughs> <laughs> And you know he got away with it, shit. Yeah. You know, so what can you say? Good to know. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I remember back in the day uh, uh, we were training in the gold gym there, and Gunther showed us some uh, place uh, close by the gold gym, and they had a, a fat-free cheesecake. I mean, uh, we never tested if there was a fat-free, but the cheesecake is cheesecake, and we would just shoot the insulin and, and go and have a half of the cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> what, Niels, what was the most insulin you ever took in one shot? For me, yeah. I never did more than 20. Okay. I, I had the guys that did a 30, but I never did more than 20. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of insulin, yeah. Uh, 30, 30, 30 units, you got to eat, what, 600 grams of carbs for that? Yeah, yeah, you yeah, shit load, but you know. Uh, you know how it is. I mean, uh, I advise some of the bodybuilders with specific amount of protein, let's say, right. and uh, uh, amount of insulin. But they voluntarily, you know, decided to do a little bit more. You know, if I said 20, you know, they would do 30 and 40. Or if I give them 400 grams of protein daily, which you know it's a shitload, yeah. you know, guys would try 500 and 600, you know, like, and they would actually swear that they, they got the better results. Yeah. So, you know. Now, you're, you, look, Milos, you were no, no, by no means a conservative guy. I mean, you, you, you believe in certain drug protocols that work. Do you think the guys today are out of control with some of the dosages you hear out there? Yeah, absolutely. I think they're, they're, they're crazy out of control. But this came you know, from uh, you know, steroid dealers going on those forums and, and bullshitting people, like you know, guys taking uh, 10 times the amount that they actually do. Uh, there is still, if you, if you search on the getbig.com, I think it's about 2006 or seven where I got involved in a, one of those uh, you know, debates and I, I posted Olympia Cycle. Right. And I put the exact Olympia Cycle you know, most of the guys were doing and uh, just about you know, 50 guys there said, fuck you, Miller, you're a fucking liar, you know, bullshit. <laughs> and actually some of my guys were afraid and they were taking considerably less. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah, well, I guess out of respect, I shouldn't tell the name, even though it's a good thing. But uh, yeah, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say those guys. But they're, they're top Olympia competitors. What's, what's, what was a typical Olympia cycle back in the uh, you know, early 2000s, would you think? Uh, 750 milligrams of test, right? Okay. You know, either sustenone or any other ester. Right. You know, mixed with, now, if you're going to change like every four, every six weeks, and you have a you know, 12 or 16 weeks uh, uh, before the Olympia, we have a three or four rotations, right? So we take some anabolic androgenic uh, with antiestrogen, and it would be usually six to nine hundred milligrams uh, in addition to um, the uh, testosterone. Yeah, uh, all the way through. You know, switching. You know, that closer to the contest, you're just using the agents that uh, makes you hold no water. 
And, uh, you know, so, so some of the guys actually did a little bit more. And uh, I know that some of the gurus used the higher amounts, but uh, I think that uh, 750 milligrams, I never did more than 750 a, a week of test. Mm. Uh, most of my guys actually uh, were doing about there. You know, so, somebody would do a double. But uh, okay, I, I would tell you, you know, something I'm, I'm sure you're going to want to hear it. Um, you know how Bader was uh, uh, inviting bodybuilders there in uh, uh, Kuwait? Right. And I guess as a good host, he would just tell you what you need for the next seven days. Right? right. So whatever you would need for seven days, he would provide you. Well, you know, one of the guys, you know, for seven days asked for, you know, 21 sustenance. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that? I well, I can't say the name out of respect, but, you know, put it this way, you know, at that time, you know, Dennis James, uh, you know, called me and, uh, you know, he didn't tell me that uh, I was on a three-way call. So he goes like, Milos, Milos, okay, come on, tell me how much uh, testosterone will take a week? I said, what the fuck, Dennis, why are you asking me such a stupid fucking, no, tell me, tell me. So I said 750. And then I hear, you know, somebody else say, bullshit. <laughs> Right? And that somebody else was the one that was doing a three a day for a love of God. Oh my God! Seven hundred fifty milligrams a day. Yes. Wow. So um, there, there, are guys. Uh, I had an athlete that came to my gym, right, and uh, proudly claimed I'm um, a living proof that no amount of steroids can kill the man. <laughs> How much was he taking? I'm serious. What? Huh? How much was he taking? He's still alive. He's still alive. <laughs> What was his dosages? Uh, you would not believe. I mean, there was a 20 cc a day of a various shit. Oh my god! Yeah. People are crazy. You, yeah, you, yeah. you knew I mean, you knew Momo Beneziza, obviously, and um, obviously he was he his cycle seems mild compared to what some of the guys are taking today, and he absolutely. died. And, yes, absolutely, and. Uh, you know, it, it's really soft, uh, you know, spot for me because I, I, I saw him dying, you know. I was in the room when that happened. You know, uh, Momo was probably one of the most muscular guy considering his uh, height. You know, he, he was incredibly respectful what he has accomplished. I was at that European Tour 92. Uh, you know, uh, he didn't play that well at Olympia and he was the one... Uh, supporting his family, so it was very important for him to make uh, you know, crazy money on the European tour. So from each uh, country that we were going, he was looking for you know specific diuretics. And then sometimes, you know how we have a um, a Dr. Zai in uh, uh, America, and it's like uh, um, spironolactone and hydrochlorothiazide. Right. Well, you go to different countries, like in Italy, Spain, they have a a Dr. Zine, and it's. Uh, Altizid instead of hydrochlorothiazide, and then in each country we were going, he was uh, you know taking a little bit of, you know different kind of, kind of diuretics, and obviously you know get himself in trouble that uh, you know, pretty much uh, you know he was cramping up on the stage, he couldn't even breathe, and uh, uh, you know there was uh, uh, instead of putting him immediately into the hospital, you know the the thing is it was better if he just goes to hotel and, and rest and. Uh, you know, rehydrate and all that stuff. And a mistake that happened was that uh, a doctor that came, without really checking his potassium levels, shoot him in potassium injection. And uh, shortly oh. after, you know, it's uh, what happened. You know, so, he, so you think the doctor killed him, huh, Milos? Yes. You think that doctor is the one who was responsible for his death? Absolutely. I mean, uh, wow. Never heard that before. Say, you know, put it this way, okay, and I'm going to tell you the same story. I don't know if uh, you heard of it, like in 2004, I wasn't working with um, Mustafa Mohammed, but there was, uh, I, I was preparing uh, uh, Gustavo Badal for the Olympian. He was the third, and I was having dinner with him, and then I got the phone call from Sean Ray, and he said, you you got to, you know, run to room 505. Mustafa Mohammed is, like, in trouble. So I got there. And, uh, you know, he cramped up, like every single muscle, you know, was cramped up. He was screaming. And Sean was giving him Gatorade and, you know, so I said, wait, 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 like, what did you use? And he says, Aldactone. 
and I know that he was uh, uh, you know loading himself with the potassium. Oh, what a dummy! Yeah, well, you know, you know, some Germans, you know, and they were in fabulous condition, were actually doing those kind of things. Like it's super risky. Your heart is about to stop any moment. But yeah, you know, they they use it well. You know, to make long story short, a paramedics came. And they're gonna, they were going to immediately hook him up on uh, electrolytes, right? Mm -hmm. So when I said that there was a potassium in this electrolyte solution, I say you cannot. And, uh, you know, they, they told me that I'm interfering with medical procedure to get the fuck out. You know, so I screamed at them. Yeah. And you know, I didn't allow it. So we went, I went into paramedics uh, car, went to the hospital. And a uh, doctor came out and he was saying, like, oh, you know, I understand that you're interfering with the, you know, emergency medical procedure, I say, yes, doc, I just, please want to ask you, are you going to check, check his potassium level? You know, because it's off the charts, I guarantee you. So he went, you know, uh, back there, and then 15 minutes later, he came out, like, oh, my God, you know, thank God you told me this, so you're going to kill him. Wow. He was off the chart. And then he, he was like asking, like, how do I know? Like, well, you know, uh, doctors usually, they see dehydrated, uh, athlete, they would uh, assume that all his electrolytes are, you know, uh, gone, and the potassium also being one of them, so they would replenish it. Right. You know, so, you know, this was uh, awakening there, and uh, I wrote the article about this hyperkalemia who uh, warned some other competitors, so they're not going to get in uh, that much trouble. But interestingly, a week later, I'm going to Amsterdam for a Grand Prix there. Mustafa was there. And on the street, oh, Milos, my brother, you know, you know, come see, you know, what I look like. I said, okay, so I came into his room, and there was about, you know, ten pounds of of dates <laughs> with, with potassium in them, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh my god, you know, okay, he he wasn't eating as, as much bananas as last time, but he had a fucking shitload of uh, uh, dates, and said, okay, you must have which diuretics did you use? Oh, that kind, of course. It's like, man, come on, you know, please, you know. So I wanted to give him some loop diuretic to, to, you know, get it out. Yeah. But no, 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 no. It's very, very important, you know. I, I want to qualify for the Olympia, and of course he did qualify for Olympia. But already after pre-judging, he was, uh, you know, hardly able to move, and immediately after the show, the same shit happened. You know, now Ronnie Coleman was in his room, uh, in a, in a hotel. And, uh, uh, you know, trying to massage him and give him some fluids, whatever else. Right. Until paramedics came. And the same story, you know, paramedics came and I have to stop them from being electrolyte. So I went to Amsterdam Hospital with him. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> and so, yeah, so anyway, to make a long story short, yeah, there is, uh, you know, so much... Uh, um, misconception about dangers of steroids. I think that uh, diuretics are much greater danger, yeah. you know, to body pillar. And uh, steroids actually, if used wisely, can enhance somebody's health. Yeah. Now, I, I think that's a very, very valid story you told because a lot of guys, most most smart guys, use potassium sparing diuretics, whether it be aldactone or diazide. And if you cramp on those diuretics and you put potassium in, you make it worse because there's no potassium deficiency. It's only a yeah. sodium deficiency. So the, that's why they're used. They're used, we use potassium sparing diuretics. So this way, if you do cramp, you know how to fix it. You put sodium into the, in, into the equation. So yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you did say, like, I didn't know that Ben Aziza died because of that. And uh, that's the first time I heard that. And I think a lot of people probably never realized that really the doctors, the paramedics killed Ben Aziza in a sense, because they didn't know what they were doing. I was there, I mean, uh, uh... I've seen it all uh, because Thierry Pastel was uh, very good friends with uh, uh, Momo and uh, you know, Doctor. There was a two different cars coming from uh, Den Haag, where it was a contest to Middle Harness, you know, where it was a hotel. So they came there earlier, and Doctor was already sent, and Doctor already shoot him with the potassium. Oh, oh my uh, God! You know, so minutes later, I mean, uh, Thierry Pastel ran into the restaurant. I said, please, 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 you know, uh, uh, moment is not good. We ran to see him, and it was the exact moment when he just completely locked up. Wow. I mean, uh, uh, Porter Pochal, he was a, paramed uh, I mean, a, a fireman, 
So he was immediately, you know, giving him CPR until uh, uh, um, paramedics came. You know, but uh, you know, pretty much uh, it, it was all over there in the room. Even though they said that he he died on the way to, yeah. to the hospital. Yeah, very, very sad story. You know, people don't realize when they put animals to sleep, they give them a, a potassium shot. It, it it stops their heart and. Uh, very yes. dangerous to play with potassium. That's one of the most dangerous things you could possibly do. And that's why I recommend that people never use potassium depleting diuretics. Um, so, but that's all, we could do another whole show just on diuretic usage, I'm sure, Milos. I, I'd like to do some more educational shows with you because I think that I know that people are going to love this interview. Uh, we got it. We got to cut it short because we're coming to the end of the hour. But um, I, I'd love to do more. Subi, I want to ask you before we go. Um, you know, if people uh, want to go, uh, you know, see some of your seminars, do you have a schedule of, of athletes that you're going to be uh, releasing over the next year? Um, yeah, there's, there's a few events that will go on. So I run a page on Instagram with XE Promotion. So anything that I put up or do is usually on there. So any, any questions, anything, they could just send me a DM and I'll be able to answer them. But at the moment, um, next week, I have Jay Cutler um, coming over and after the body power, I have Courtney King as well. So okay. I kind of like do work for companies as well. So it's, it's kind of like ties in with that. What, what if athletes want to contact you and, and have you maybe set up seminars for them? Could they do that? Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, no issues at all. I could do that. Okay. Not a problem. Well, thank you for uh, informing me that Milos was going to be at your house this weekend. Guys, best of luck with the seminar, Milos. I love interviewing yep. you. Great, 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 great interview. Uh, Dave, you know, as soon as I heard it was uh, RX, Michael and Dave, you know, I immediately said yes. I would do it anytime. You know, I know I always have a good time talking to you and yeah. uh, exchanging, uh, you know, some of our, our experiences. Yeah. So anytime you need me, I'm available. Okay, I'm, I'm going to call you on that because I think that this is going to be a super popular episode and they're going to demand more of the mind. His name is Milo <laughs> Sarshev and uh, he's appearing in St. Albans, England this weekend. That's going to take us to the end of another episode of Live With, brought to you by Yamamoto Nutrition. I'm Dave Palumbo, and we'll see you next time.